Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell if you enjoy this episode. Donna Barnhard worked for the Sundrop Bottling Company for nearly 19 years. She was kind, friendly, and loved her job. On Friday, June 13th, 2008, she went in expecting a normal day, but things would turn deadly. Daryl Knowles, a resident of Concord, North Carolina, walked into the bottling plant that morning to turn in a job application. He never imagined that he would never walk out. Sometime around 10 a.m., an unknown assailant entered the building, stole an undisclosed amount of money, and shot and killed Donna and Daryl before disappearing into a nearby wooded area. Despite exhaustive efforts by police, they were not able to locate the suspect. Twelve years have passed, and for all that time, two families have struggled to accept the loss of their loved ones while a killer walks the streets. Concord police have followed hundreds of tips, but they've all failed to deliver a suspect who remains unknown. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 114, The Sundrop Murders. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine a terrifying double murder that took place in Concord, North Carolina. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow Trace Evidence on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. The show is also on MeWe and Minds. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merchandise, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donating options, and contact information to submit case suggestions, or you can email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. In June of 2008, an unknown gunman walked into the Sundrop Bottling Company in Concord, North Carolina, and murdered Donna Barnhard and Daryl Knowles. Twelve years later, police are still searching for the killer. This is episode 114, The Sundrop Murders. It was set to be a warm spring day when the sun rose up over the rolling hills and tree-lined streets of Concord, North Carolina. The city was in the midst of a growth spurt, its population having exploded with a 104% increase in the previous 10 years. Concord itself would eventually be named as having the 16th fastest growing economy of any city in the country. One of the mainstays of town was an old red brick building sitting just to the northeast of the intersection of Branchview Drive and Cabarrus Avenue. Everyone was familiar with the building, and it was often used as a point of reference for giving directions. It was as much a part of the town as your average citizen, perhaps more so due to its familiar red silhouette set against the blue sky. Sadly, though, on a sunny June morning in 2008, it would become the scene of a double murder, which continues to haunt the city of Concord and the state of North Carolina as a whole. In 1954, Bill and Margaret King opened the Sundrop Bottling Company there at 360 Old Salisbury Concord Road. Sundrop is a citrus-flavored soda, somewhat along the lines of Mountain Dew or Squirt, and has maintained a high level of popularity throughout the American South since its creation in 1930. This particular location would remain in the King family until December of 2016, when it was sold off to Cheerwine, another popular southern soft drink company. In 2008, though, the Sundrop Bottling Company was owned and operated by John King. He'd received news of the tragic incident that Friday morning while vacationing with his family in Oak Island, a seaside town popular for its tourism and beaches. According to the Charlotte Observer, 
a worker rang King's phone and explained the situation. John turned on the TV and watched as police cars flooded into the parking lot of the family business. King called his wife, packed up his belongings, and the family began the 200-mile drive back towards Concord. It was a tense drive fraught with grief that would ultimately deliver John to a place of sorrow and pain. It's never been mentioned whether or not John, or anyone else for that matter, made note of the date. It was Friday, June 13th. For 59-year-old Donna Kleinsmith Barnhart, it was just another Friday. While she was set to work at Sundrop that day, she had big plans for the evening, taking her granddaughters to their dance recital. According to friends and family, Donna's grandchildren were the light of her life, and she loved every moment she spent with them. She, unfortunately, would become a victim of murder that day. The other victim would be 44-year-old Daryl Knowles, an out-of-work fiber optics technician looking to pick up a job in the interim. Knowles' wife, Tressy, 43 at the time, drove him down to the building where he planned to hand in an application for a part-time position. Tressy pulled her car into a parking space and sat in the morning light waiting on her husband, but Daryl never came walking out, and when the truth of what happened hit her, she was beyond consolable. Her uncle, Reverend Donnie Tomlin of the Wilmar Park Baptist Church, later told the Rocky Mount Telegram, quote, She's in pretty rough shape right now. We just have to get her through it, end quote. When asked about Daryl, Tomlin went on to say, quote, He was a great guy, just a good family man. This is so tough for everyone, end quote. At approximately 9 a.m. on the 13th, according to the Concord Police Department, an unknown individual walked up to the building and grabbed at the main entry doors trying to get inside. At that time, the doors were still locked and the unknown person wasn't able to get in. Approximately one hour later, the murders would happen inside of the lobby just beyond those doors. While police have never fully confirmed that the man trying to gain entry the first time was the killer, they have told the media that the man resembled the composite drawing of the alleged killer. The assailant has been described as being a black male, standing 5 feet 7 inches tall and weighing between 160 and 170 pounds. The man was of slender build, had dark eyes and hair worn in shoulder-length dreadlocks. He was wearing a dark cap, blue jeans, and a white shirt at the time of the crime. A description was given by an employee who saw the individual leaving the building carrying a box within moments of the shooting. While authorities received this description and created a composite in the days after the murders, they did not publicly release an updated image until several months later, telling reporters they wanted to verify crucial details before they made this new composite public. When asked about the sketch, Concord Police Deputy Chief Guy Smith stated, quote, this person could be related to the shootings, but we won't know until we're able to speak with him. End quote. The man seen in the image has been referred to as a person of interest rather than a suspect, according to the Independent Tribune. Friends and family of Donna Barnhart handed out copies of the composite to drivers passing by the Sundrop building the day it was released, and police received several calls with tips, though nothing solid appears to have developed. Donna Kleinsmith Barnhard was born on January 11, 1949 in Oceanside, California, though she would be raised in the town of Paradise. Donna was one of four children, having two brothers and one sister. Growing up in California, Donna rubbed elbows with a few celebrities. According to her obituary, she was once a babysitter for Jim Backus, who famously played the millionaire Thurston Howell on Gilligan's Island and she met John F. Kennedy some years before he went on to become the 35th President of the United States. Donna attended Paradise High School, and after graduation, enlisted in the Navy, serving for three years during the Vietnam War. Donna was stationed in Fort Myers, Virginia, and worked in intelligence, specifically code-breaking, for the Pentagon. Donna graduated first in her class at Radioman School, being one of only two women in the school, which held 67 students. After service, 
Donna settled in Concord, North Carolina with her then-husband, Preston Barnhart. Donna would live the next 39 years of her life there, raising family and taking on a slew of different responsibilities. Donna had three children, a daughter, Rebecca, and two sons, Sean and Seth. Donna was a traveler. She was always on the move, and she possessed an undeniable love for the ocean, visiting it as often as she could and taking cruises. More than anything, though, she adored her children and her family, and they all kept close to one another. She was known throughout the community as kind, a happy woman, with several describing her as happy-go-lucky. She was smart, driven, and independent. She enjoyed working and made it a point to excel at everything she put her mind to. She was a woman of many parts, working different jobs from operating a children's clothing store to running the scoreboard of the nearby Charlotte Motor Speedway. She attended college at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, obtaining a degree in sociology, which she utilized to teach at Central Cabarrus and Northwest high schools. Donna picked up a job working for Sundrop as the office manager and would remain there for 18 years, up until the very day that she was murdered in cold blood by an unknown assailant. She had been part of Sundrop for so long, she felt like a member of the family, according to John King. His 24-employee operation was close, and Donna was one of, if not the most respected and well-liked members of that family. Sundrop owner John King, when asked about Donna, had this to say to WCNC NBC Charlotte. As far as an employee, she was loyal. She was very dedicated, hardworking. More than that, she was a friend. She'd been with us for 18 years. We've lost a, a family member and a friend. It'll never be the same around there. There isn't a lot of information publicly available about Daryl, but what is there displays a man of strong faith and family values. Daryl Wayne Knowles was born on November 17, 1963 in Concord, he had two sisters, Debbie and Wanda. Raised by his parents, R.S. and Beatrice, he grew up in the surrounding area. Being native to the heavy forested areas of North Carolina, Darrell had a love and affinity for hunting. Beyond that, he was dedicated to his church and to worship. Darrell attended at Bright Light Baptist, where he was a member of the choir. Daryl's online obituary is flooded with complimentary statements showing how many truly loved him. One comment read in part, quote, There are only three things I can think of that Daryl truly loved, God, his family, and hunting, in that order, end quote. Daryl fell in love with and married Tressie Quinn Hackett, with whom he had a son, Joseph, and a daughter, Jennifer. The couple met at a high school football game in 1981, and while Tressie has said she wasn't sure about where things would go, he knew she was the one for him the moment they met. The two married a year later, on August 13th. In a strange and bitter twist of irony, for Daryl, 13 became his lucky number. Several people in Daryl's life have spoken about his fierce dedication to his family and his admiration for them. In fact, it's been said multiple times that if Daryl wasn't talking about the church, the choir, or his religion, he was bragging about his family. Spencer and Wendy Pritchard commented on his obituary explaining how he would often rub his stomach talking about how delicious his wife's cooking was. Daryl went on to become a doting grandfather after his daughter married and had her first child, and it seems clear by all accounts that Daryl was absolutely over the moon to have become a grandfather. Daryl's children have had a lot of things to say about their father, showing how much they cared for him. Daryl's daughter described him as a gentleman who raised her right, but that he laughed a lot and could often be a clown. His son Joseph noted that, while a lot of other fathers were eager to go out hunting and get some time alone, Daryl never wanted to be far from his family, and if he was going on a trip, there was no doubt they'd be going with him. Daryl worked for years as a fiber optics splicer with the Concord Telephone Company, but lost his job in 2007 when the company was bought out by Windstream, 
a telephone and high-speed internet provider. Shortly after being laid off, Daryl was hired on by another tech company, but this job was short-lived. As a result of the loss of his jobs, Daryl was out trying to find something to hold him over while he pursued openings in his field. Approximately six months passed before Daryl's search yielded a possibility. On Friday, June 13th, that job hunt brought him down to the Sundrop Bottling Company where, tragically, he would lose his life in what can only be described as a violent and senseless crime. Cut down for no reason by an unknown assailant, both Daryl and Donna were stolen from their loved ones in a moment of madness which, to this day, remains without explanation or justice. Details of the crime itself have been released very selectively to this date. Police have been extremely limited in what they're willing to say, though in interviews they've been very outspoken about the case being active. Sometime before 10 a.m. on June 13th, Daryl Knoll's wife drove him up to the Sundrop Bottling Company. Daryl walked into the building, planning to turn in an application for a part-time job. According to Tressy, the two had been out running errands together before they arrived at the company. Tressy offered to run the filled-out application inside, but Daryl asked her to wait in the car while he brought it in. Tressy later told reporters that Daryl loved Sundrop and told her right before exiting the car that he was going to get that job. When Daryl didn't come out within the next few minutes, Tressy has previously said that she assumed he must have turned in his application and maybe been offered an interview or a job outright. She didn't think it was strange that he didn't come right back out. She was hopeful that things were going well inside. At approximately 10 a.m., an unknown individual walked through the front doors of the building. The exact details of what transpired remains a mystery, and while investigators may have a better idea of what occurred, publicly, there are still a lot of questions about the details. What we do know is that, within a short span of a few minutes, both Donna and Daryl were shot and killed by this unknown assailant during what has been called a robbery gone wrong. Now, if you think like me, you're wondering, who exactly goes to a soda bottling facility with the intention of robbing it? While the murders were taking place, Tressy was still sitting in the car, eventually beginning to wonder what was taking so long. Suddenly, she noticed the flashing lights of an emergency vehicle and for the most part thought there must have been an accident or something had gone wrong and maybe Daryl was still inside helping out. Her mind began to turn towards something darker though, thinking that Daryl may have instead witnessed a crime. Tressy began to dial her daughter, planning to explain how they had come down to Sundrop to turn in an application when the number of emergency personnel and police began to grow and she realized something terrible had happened. At that time in the morning, there were only three employees in the building, including Donna, and Daryl was the fourth person inside. The two other employees were in a different part of the plant when one of them reportedly heard gunfire. As they made their way towards the lobby, the location from which the shots were heard, one of them witnessed the killer exiting the building carrying a box the contents of which have never been fully revealed by police, if indeed they know. Reportedly, the two employees came upon the grisly scene and dialed 911 just after 10 a.m. and told the operator that they had two people down in the lobby as the result of gunshots. Initial canvassing of the area by investigators resulted in several witnesses reporting seeing a man who fit the description of the shooter running across Branch View Drive, disappearing into the tree line. In response, Concord police entered the wooded area for a ground search while also utilizing tracking dogs. A state police helicopter hovered above, searching for the suspect and waiting to radio down to officers on foot, but the suspect was never seen, and none of the police on the ground were able to locate him. The search expanded into a one-mile radius and was kicked off within minutes of the shooting, but the killer had seemingly disappeared. It was debated at the time whether or not the suspect had fled on foot but had a car waiting for him somewhere, or maybe an accomplice waiting to pick him up. Deputy Police Chief Smith later told reporters that there were 30 investigators working the case and following up on tips. In the hours and days after the crime, 
Police were deluged with tips and calls, though no major leads were developed, and within days the tips began running dry. According to investigators, both victims were killed with a handgun, though the type and caliber has never been revealed. Details about the murders themselves have also been fairly limited, with police confirming both victims had been shot, though they wouldn't comment on how many shots had been fired, nor how many times each victim had been hit. In terms of the robbery, police confirmed that some money had been taken from the office, though they would not comment on exactly how much. It has since been speculated that the box the killer was seen leaving with may in fact have been a cash box. There's been some discussion about the possibility that the killer may have been there to get the money from the safe, though I haven't found many details about this. Either way, the question authorities and the families have been left with is, if robbery was the motive, why did the assailant kill Donna and Daryl? When John King arrived at the plant that day, he found a horrible scene. Donna and Daryl were gone, but the scene itself had not been cleaned. It was a shock to the system and made him sick, not just seeing what had happened, but wondering why it had happened at all. King and his wife, Connie, met privately with the families and mourned with them. Later, they brought in counselors to speak with employees who were struggling to accept what had happened. On June 18th, less than a week after the crime, police were already feeling frustrated with the lack of evidence and information. In hopes of gathering new leads or information, officers were posted to hand out flyers to drivers passing by the business, but little if anything developed from those flyers. That same night, a prayer vigil was held for the victims and their families, and with the hope that someone might know something about the crime and come forward. When asked about any tips or leads, Deputy Police Chief Smith told the Charlotte Observer, quote, We have followed up on everything. End quote. Within the first month of the murders, a $50,000 reward was offered by John King for information leading to an arrest. While police publicly stated that they had learned a lot in the previous weeks, they still didn't have enough to make an arrest and were hoping for more. To them, the public was the key of the crime, and they made several public pleas for someone to come forward, as they knew that someone out there knows who the killer is. A confidential tip line was set up, and while some calls came in and leads were followed, there still wasn't enough to move the case forward. It seemed the more time passed, the less information investigators had at their disposal. In August of 2008, some two months after the murders, Daryl Knoll's widow, Tressy, found herself in the news for a different crime. As the result of an investigation conducted in the months prior to Daryl's murder, police served warrants against Tressy for embezzlement. Reportedly, Tressie had worked at Spectrum Sales and was charged with five counts of embezzlement for an amount of $60,000. Investigators stated that they hadn't charged her until August because they didn't find it appropriate considering what had happened, but ultimately had to follow through with their legal obligations. Police told reporters that they had no reason to believe the embezzlement was in any way connected to the murders. Despite all of my efforts, I can't find an update on that case beyond 2008, so whether or not Tressy faced trial or was vindicated, I can't confirm. Sadly for the family and investigators, the case began growing cold. There was a jump in calls in September of 2008, just a few weeks after the new sketch was unveiled, when America's Most Wanted announced they'd be doing a segment on the case, but within weeks the tip line had all but dried up. That same month, Governor Mike Easley increased the award being offered for information to $85,000, the largest being offered in the state of North Carolina at that time. That episode of America's Most Wanted aired in May of 2009. Despite their efforts, Concord police couldn't seem to get a break or any new information which would lead to a suspect. Once again, the case went cold. In hopes of raising awareness, in October of 2011, NASCAR driver Kevin Conway featured photos of Donna and Darrell on the hood of his car at the raceway in Charlotte. Several sponsors also chipped in, 
hoping to work through community outreach and bring the case to more people in an effort to draw in tips and information. Deputy Chief Smith told reporters, quote, We're hoping someone will see this race car carrying the image of Donna Barnard and Daryl Knowles on TV or in the news, and it will trigger someone to come forward to give us the missing information we need to solve this case. End quote. Unfortunately, up to today, there have been few, if any, developments in the case. While Concord police have been emphatic that they are still investigating it, they simply haven't received the breaks they need. Banners were put up in front of the Sundrop building bearing Donna and Daryl's images. New flyers were produced and handed out. Digital campaigns on social media worked to bring attention to the case, and yet, after all these years, there haven't been any major developments. When asked about leads which should have been pursued, Deputy Smith told WSOC-TV, quote, We've been all over the state. We've been out of the state. We want to bring closure to the families and for the Sun Drop Bottle Company. It's been tragic for them, and we want to bring them justice. End quote. In 2015, there was a lot of discussion about the murders on social media as information went viral regarding the police composite of the suspect and a man named Darren Manuel. Darren Manuel, along with Terrell Thomas, were arrested and convicted of being involved in a shooting at a rest stop along Interstate 85. 43-year-old Greg McKee had stopped at mile marker 60 to use the rest area in late 2015. While he was washing his hands, Manuel and Thomas stood next to him. One of them was brandishing a handgun. When McKee tried to run, he was shot in the back, which resulted in him being paralyzed from the thigh down. Manuel pled guilty in October of 2017 for pulling the trigger, ultimately being sentenced to 18 to 22 years in prison. Two months later, in December, Thomas was found guilty of conspiracy to commit robbery attempted robbery with a dangerous weapon, and attempted first-degree murder. At the time of their arrests in 2015, Major Gary Hatley of the Concord Police told Spectrum News that they'd received a lot of tips about similarities between the Sundrop shooter and Manuel's mugshot. According to Hatley, they were investigating any potential connection, but as of this episode, no connection has ever been established. This was the last update in the case, which has now gone unsolved for nearly 12 years. For 12 years, the families of Daryl Knowles and Donna Barnhard have had to struggle with coming to terms with their losses. They've had to swallow the bitter pill of knowing that whoever committed this crime is still out there somewhere, free to live, while their loved ones are gone. A composite sketch of the suspect is available. A tip line remains open and a reward continues to be offered for an arrest. Both the Barnhart and Knowles families continue to hope that justice will come, that the man who killed their mother, father, brother, and sister will be captured. However, with as little information as there appears to be, and as few leads that have developed over the past 12 years, it's difficult to cling to that hope too tightly. Twelve years ago, a lone gunman walked into the Sundrop bottling plant and opened fire. He walked out with an undisclosed amount of money and left two victims in his wake. Donna Barnhard worked at the plant for nearly 19 years, was the beloved member of the staff and a valued member of her community. Daryl Knowles was a man looking for a job to continue supporting his family. He attended church on Sundays, sang in the choir, and was all around considered to be a good man with strong family values. Then, one man, in what can only be described as madness, took both their lives and disappeared into the woods. He has never been found. There aren't a lot of different theories about what happened that Friday the 13th in 2008. We know that it was a single individual who walked into the plant, committed the murders, and robbed the office. What we don't know is what the driving force was behind it, whether or not the killer had an accomplice, and whether or not the crime was truly due to a robbery gone wrong, or if the robbery itself was a cover-up for murder. 
These are all questions which have been asked over the past 12 years, but none of them have ever gotten answers. One major question at the heart of this case is also about the killer himself. Was this a local or someone who came to know the plant and decided to hit it? I've always wondered why someone would not only target a bottling plant for a robbery, but also why they would do it in broad daylight. Now, maybe they needed an employee there to be able to give them access to the safe. Sure, that makes sense. But who thinks about a bottling plant as being the location that's going to have a large sum of money laying around? I could just be naive, but I've never driven past a Coca-Cola factory and thought there must be a ton of money in there. Perhaps this is why so many people have wondered about the possibility that the assailant could have been a former employee. We don't know how much knowledge the police have of a suspect. It's safe to assume that they would have gone over employee records going back several years and likely asked employees if anyone recognized the composite sketch. That all seems rational enough. The two employees who were present that day have never been interviewed by the media or spoken about it publicly. I couldn't even find an account of them being named, but it seems likely that if they knew the suspect, they'd have told authorities that it looked like someone they knew. That being said, some have wondered about the possibility that it could have been someone who had worked there years earlier, or maybe had worked a job that involved the plant but never directly worked for Sundrop itself. Then, there are those who think it's just random. Interstate 85 was just three miles to the southwest of the building, meaning that there was a rather quick escape route assuming that the suspect had access to a vehicle. We know that he fled into the woods quickly after committing the murders, but whether or not he had placed a car somewhere or maybe had someone in a car waiting for him is unknown. It does seem strange though, doesn't it? Who plans out the robbery of a bottling company unless that person knows there's money there and has a general sense of just how much money is there? Concord has plenty of businesses that are bound to have more money in them than that particular one did. So again, we come back to the question of why rob this particular location? It's just never made any sense to me. Maybe one of you has a better idea about it than I do. There are some reasons to consider, though. The crime occurred on a Friday morning. Now, I don't know what kind of money moves through a location like this. I can't imagine there's large sums of cash just laying around. However, there is the possibility of payments from people who Sundrop is distributing to. This particular plant distributed to five different counties in the area, so maybe there's money coming in from those stores. There's likely cash and change brought in from vending machines that are being stocked. Friday morning is typically the day that cash deposits would be performed by businesses. Whether or not the cash is picked up by armored cars, or taken by personnel to the bank itself is debatable. I've worked at large companies that did cash deposits through office managers, and I've worked at small businesses that did cash deposits through armored cars. I think every business is a little different in the way they choose to handle this. Friday is also often payday for a lot of businesses, and while I can't find this answer, I'd love to know if Sundrop paid by cash or by check. It was 2008 and every job I worked in the years surrounding that paid me by check, specifically bi-weekly. That doesn't mean that was the case here though. Then again, our killer might have known which one it was. There's been an argument that the crime may have been committed randomly. Not so much a spur of the moment, but that the location was selected randomly. That's certainly a possibility, but why then did the suspect try to enter the building an hour before the doors opened, only to return later? You'd imagine if you were planning to rob a place, you'd have some general idea about what time that place was open to give you access in the first place. A gun was used, so we know this wasn't something that just popped into the killer's head that morning while he was driving around. He brought that gun for a purpose. Whether or not that purpose was meant to be murder, we can't really be sure. One question which has been asked a lot is, was this always meant to be a robbery or was it meant to be a murder? If it was intended as a murder, with robbery either as a side plan or just to cover up the actual intent, the only person that could have been the target would have been Donna herself. Daryl wasn't meant to be there. He just popped in to drop off an application. For him, it is, tragically, very much a wrong place, wrong time situation. 
It wouldn't really make sense for a killer to be waiting for him since no one knew he would be there until that morning. Beyond that, it really wouldn't explain the killer trying to gain access to the building an hour before he even arrived. On the other hand, if Donna herself was the target, why didn't the suspect know what time she'd be there? If you're specifically targeting someone, you usually have a general sense about when that person will be vulnerable. I've seen a lot of back and forth about this, whether or not the crime was in some way connected to either one of the victims, and while it's entirely possible, I just don't see much, if any, evidence to make that connection. I admit, while I don't like the theory generally, there does seem to be some sense of randomness about this crime. The only thing that doesn't appear to be random is, for whatever reason, the killer specifically wanted to do it at this location. He could have gone to the door, found it locked, and gone over to a gas station or any other business in the area to make a quick cash grab, but he didn't. He waited, he came back later, and this time, it was open. That is, of course, if it's the same person. I'm under the assumption there must have been some kind of outside surveillance system or a witness who's never been discussed. We know someone tried to gain entry to the building at approximately 9 a.m., but we've never been told how we know that. While surveillance would make sense, wouldn't the police then have footage of the actual killer fleeing from the scene rather than going off a description from two employees inside who saw him running away? In a WSOC-TV article about the case, written two years after, they noted that the building had added a surveillance system, fence, and intercom. This seems to make it clear that there was no surveillance system in 2008, which makes me ask again, how did they know about this person trying to get in? This has never been fully explained, and it's really an interesting detail of the case that I tried desperately to find an answer to, but I couldn't. It had to have been from a witness, right? That's the only answer that makes sense to me, and only the police know if it's right. While, for the most part, the theories could go on endlessly, there's still a few details about the case which just don't sit right with me. Daryl's wife, Tressa, dropped him off at the building that day to turn in his application. There hasn't been a lot of details discussed about what was going on with her that particular day. We know she was in the parking lot when the crime happened. We know that she didn't become aware there was an issue until she saw emergency medical technicians arriving at the scene along with police. Now, I've looked at this building and the parking lot isn't very big. Today, there are fences up and access to the whole parking lot is blocked off. But even in 2008, when those fences weren't there, we're still not talking about a large area. We don't have any information on where Tressa parked. However, we do know that two employees inside the building heard the gunshots, but she didn't. Maybe because they were closer, maybe because she was near a busy road and they sounded like backfires, or maybe those are just the sounds someone would assume are coming from the inside of a bottling plant. Maybe the building just absorbed the sound. I can't say for sure. However, I do think if you heard loud pops that morning, you'd have told the police that you thought it was this or you thought it was that. Maybe Tressa did tell them, and maybe that's just never been reported. But it's very bizarre to me that this guy fired his gun a minimum of two times, ran out of the building, ran across a busy road and down into a woods, and while witnesses passing by noticed him, someone in the parking lot didn't. Then again, maybe she was parked behind the building or slightly off-site. It's hard to say for sure. Either that, or Tressa told the police a lot more than has ever been publicly revealed. While there haven't been any developments related to it, I did want to address the alleged I-85 rest stop connection. Looking at the artist's composite and the mugshot of Darren Manuel, I can completely understand why so many people thought this could be the suspect. Their appearances are very similar, right down to the hair. The problem is, the Sundrop murders happened in 2008. Emmanuel was arrested in 2015, so in terms of physical appearance, height, weight, hairstyle, all of that could have been very different. We also know that the suspect in the Sundrop murders was believed to have been in his mid to late 20s. Manuel would have been 19 years old in 2008. Of course, some people are just bad at guessing ages. 
I suppose the really intriguing aspect of this theory revolves around the fact that Interstate 85 was just a few miles from the Sundrop Bottling Company. Being that Manuel struck at the rest stop off that interstate in 2015, it's logical to assume that this was an area he was familiar with. It's also very interesting to note that the rest stop shooting happened approximately six miles north of Concord, near Dale Earnhardt Boulevard. So you've got a man arrested for attempted murder during the course of a robbery, which happened to take place within seven miles of the Sundrop murders. All of that is definitely intriguing, but there's a problem. Police have never been able to make that connection. I have no doubt that authorities dug into this, especially when they started receiving calls and emails about it. However, they never came out and said there was a connection, but they also said there wasn't. Unfortunately, this is just another aspect of this case where there really isn't enough information. I don't even have enough information to have much of a solid opinion about it other than to say there's a possibility. I do believe, though, that if this was a legitimate possibility, the police would likely have said something publicly about it in the past five years. Overall, that's the main issue with covering this case and the one thing that made me wait nearly a year to do it. The police have been absolutely meticulous about not sharing any information. This leads me to believe they have more information than the general public has been made aware of, and if so, they may be closer to breaking this case than they've ever actually said. Based on the composite, the details of the crime, the sum of money taken, all of these are factors in determining who committed the crime, and so few details about any of them have been released. There's a very good chance this is a case that has a lot behind it, a lot more going on behind the scenes, but we're simply not aware of it at this time. Ultimately, when it comes to the suspect, there's only so many possibilities. He committed the crime randomly. He wanted to rob this particular location for reasons beyond understanding. He was organized, planned it, and knew what he was going to do and murdered Donna and Daryl in order to avoid leaving witnesses. Or he was disorganized, wasn't sure what he was doing, and committed the murders either out of fear in response to one of them trying to stop him, or he thought they would be able to recognize him and he didn't want to get caught. For me, though, the key to this case is finding out why the killer chose this location. Did he know the building? Had he been in it before? Did he know there was money there? And did he know it was an amount worth killing for? Was he in any way connected to that company, one of the victims or someone who worked there? Maybe it's just me. But it still makes zero sense that in a town that large with businesses all over the place, you choose to target a bottling company. Maybe we'll never know the answers, though for the sake of Donna and Daryl's families, I truly hope those answers are eventually found and the person responsible for those crimes is brought to justice. Sadly, two families have had to move forward with giant holes in them and nothing to fill. No understanding, no arrests, no viable leads, and no justice. Sadly, information in this case remains thin, and for 12 years a killer has eluded the police and managed to live his life out there, somewhere. Without new information, a confession, or some piece of hidden evidence providing new insights, the murders of Donna Barnhart and Daryl Knowles will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the murders of Donna Barnard and Daryl Knowles, there are some news article archives available and a few forums touching on the case, but honestly, there is not a ton of information out there. America's Most Wanted did a segment on the case, though I was unable to find video from that episode. If you have any information about the murders of Donna Barnard and Daryl Knowles at the Sundrop Bottling Plant in Concord, please contact the Concord Police Department at 704-920-5000. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, 
comment in the Facebook group, or email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Lately, a lot of people have been asking me about the availability of Trace Evidence merchandise. In order to view Trace Evidence merchandise, you have two options. You can go to traceevidence.threadless.com or go to the website at trace-evidence.com and click on the merch link for all purchasing options. If you're looking to support Trace Evidence and you want access to ad-free episodes and monthly bonus episodes in addition to receiving Trace Evidence stickers and merchandise, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence. Now it's time to thank Trace Evidence's amazing Patreon producers. Alicia Lorraine, Brett Eady, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Emily Smith, Emma Vachon, Jessica Chagnon, Jessica Yunt, Kevin Bonham, Lee Campbell, Megan Cotter, Michael Graves, Nick Mohar Schurz, Pamela Coburn, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Samantha Ford, Stephanie Segerist, Stephen Wyland, Tara Doble, Tom Archer, and Tracy Woods. Thank you all so much for your kindness and amazing support of Trace Evidence. That's going to do it for this week's episode. Make sure to follow me on social media at Trace Ev Pod on Twitter, Trace Evidence Pod on Instagram, Trace Evidence Podcast on YouTube, or search Facebook for Trace Evidence Podcast. For questions, comments, case suggestions, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. All social media links, contact forms, merchandise links, and more are available on the website at trace-evidence.com. I want to thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.